As you can see, Baroness Osbury is recruiting a band of adventurers for some unnamed task. I do not think I need to remind you, Acolyte Heinrich, that you represent the Temple of Pelor first and foremost, that you will act accordingly and bring praise to our faith. This is an opportunity that should not be wasted. If you have no further questions, you will assemble your gear. Be on your way. May the divine light of Pelor give you guidance and strength in all that is to come. Hello, welcome back to the Three Oaks channel. This is David. I focused my last several videos on the Culture Greyhawk campaign, which is the Temple of Elemental Evil. I decided in my campaign that all the players would start in the city of Verpabunk. And these series of videos, to start it off, is to show how my players created their backgrounds, where they're located in the world of Greyhawk, within a few hundred miles of the city of Verpabunk, and why they journeyed to the city of Verpabunk, and how they met together as a group. I ran session zero sessions with the players individually for a list of reasons. One is to create their background, find their location, do a little bit of role playing of where they came from and why they came to Verba Bank, you know, get all that into their background. And then once they got to the city, I would narrate and describe to them what's happening in the city and where they're staying. Then I'll throw some private encounters for them before they meet the rest of the party. I did that with Mascus. The wizard Mascus um, lives in the city of Verba Bank, and he actually attends the Wrinkle Academy, one of the schools of magic, of, one of two schools of magic in Verbabank, and he was sent on a mission from his master, Magister Obel, um, to the, the Church of St. Cuthbert to investigate two mounted borderers that were attacked by gnomes and a hill giant in the Kron Hills. The other video was about Urad, the ranger that came from the Gnarly Forest that was sent here to find out what was going on in the Vi County, why the Vi Count pulled back the mounted border of patrols from the Kron Hills, why the no merchant caravans were being attacked and raided, and why they were at odds with the city, and how come there's no help from the city of Verbabank with the Gnarly Forest, with the incursion of a war band of Blackthorn orcs that came from the south. And he ended up following the rumors too the chapel of St. Cuthbert to um, question those mounted borderers to find out what happened to them because he had a big interest in this. And Mascus, the wizard, had the same interest too, but given to him by his by his master, Magister Obel. Um, he also has a private quest that I gave him with a notebook, a, a note, and an amulet that he wants to find Arolan's tower to the south by Ostwerk. And then the next video was about Vigon, the mercenary fighter, the fighter from the wild coast, how he ended up from the wild coast into the city of Verbabank and his stay at Packard's Inn and meeting Urad at the Packard's Inn as well, getting rumors there at the inn. All of them encountered rumors and innuendo from the humans and the gnomes throughout the city, and it actually came across an encounter where the gnomes were having an argument with one of the merchants on the main street. So they got to witness that firsthand to see for themselves what it's like for the gnomes and the humans of the city and hear both sides of the story, try to figure out what was going on in this campaign. Real quick, um, my YouTube channel, um, I have some different playlists. That, that way you can find everything I have for this campaign. I want to point out that I have one playlist called Three Orcs D&D &D Songs. Those songs are actually written for the Temple of Elemental Evil campaign, the prophecies that you find in the module. I put them into song form so that way you can have a bard in the campaign play this prophecy to the players while they're at a tavern. And then farther down below is my Greyhawks campaign videos. I have 21 so far. Those videos right there are the first four characters of my campaign. You know, their backstories getting to the city of Verbabank. And also there's an actual video on every town in the Viscounty of Verbabank. I fully keyed and developed and created maps of all the towns of Verbabank in the campaign area. So that might be useful to some people running the campaign. Because you got to remember the players, the characters really don't know, you know, about the Temple of Elemental Evil as causing all these problems. They don't know that the Temple of Elemental Evil has agents in the city probably a noble or some rich merchants that can pull strings to get supplies and information to the temple without tipping off the Viscount what was really going on. So the players really don't know any of that. All they have heard and all they know is um, the caravans are being raided by uh, gnomes 
and other raiders and a hill giant, mounted borders were attacked by gnomes, and that there was a lot of slander and a lot of bad feelings in the city, arguing that the humans want the gnomes out, and the gnomes are threatening to leave and take their trade elsewhere to uh, Ulick or um, Divers or Keeland. And so it's, it's a bad situation right now. It's a, it's a powder keg ready to explode. And the players find themselves in the midst of all this. And I'd like to, see, I, I like to, I like to introduce these politics and things that are happening to the players in the campaign before it starts. So that way they get a feel for this being a live, living world, that things are happening around them. I kind of look at this like a mixture between the Game of Thrones and the Temple of Elemental Evil. So you got a lot of politics going on and a lot of behind the th scenes things are happening. And you got all these different nobles are up to something or another. Some are greedy, some are jealous, some are just up to no good, some just like to cause trouble. But the players don't know these nobles yet. They, don't, they only know what the general peasants would know. And, and most of the players in general are just peasants themselves so they're subject to the law whether the nobles or not they have a different guidelines of law that i created an article for that i go by but in this campaign the very first mission they're going to get is from one of the nobles and they're going to see firsthand what's really going on from their point of view hopefully by accomplishing this mission for one of the nobles they'll gain favor with one of the houses and um, by doing so will gain you disfavor with another house the opposing house and they're going to see all this and they're going to have to determine because eventually Towards the end of this campaign, they got to ferret out um, the moles, the agents in the city from the Temple of the Mental Evil and other factions. Because the, Temple of Element, because the faction of Temple of the Mental Evil isn't just one faction. There's the High Priest fa faction, which is the Elder Elemental God. And then there's the four other factions, which is Earth, Water, Air, and Fire. And they all have their own outpost out in the Viscounty. So the Mo House is just one of the outposts, which was really set up by the main Temple faction. You know, the Larith, the beautiful, is their favored, and he's he's got inner dealings, inner connections with the inner fac faction that runs the whole thing, and that was his outpost. And his orders were to raid, to raid and cause confusion, and so dissent throughout the Viscounty, but not not give away his position. Well, the other four temples are doing the same thing, and they're also located throughout the Viscounty as well. So, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what's going on with the campaign. So, in this video, we're going to talk about Heinrich, uh, the Inquisitor, cleric of Pelor. D&D had a huge impact on my life. I started playing in grade school after Star Wars came out in 1977, where I started a gaming club that led to D&D. At the time, I would be found in a classroom, keeping my head low, buried in a fantasy book. The D&D blue box set changed and consumed my life. Quickly after that, I bought the AD&D Player's Handbook by Gary Gygax, which had a massive influence on me. I highly recommend these books to read. Rise of the Dungeon Master, Gary Gygax and the Creation of D&D by David Kushner and Corin Sadmi. This graphic novel is a quick read, and it is a brief glimpse into the life of Gary Gygax, the creation of D&D, the controversy, and the effects that the game had on pop culture and many lives that it touched. The next book is Empire of Imagination, Gary Gygax and the Birth of Dungeons and Dragons by Michael Whitwer. I found that this biography is a series of fictional vignettes about events in Gary Gygax's life, loosely connected by nods at context, which is more of an inspired by true events story than an actual biography. And the last one is Of Dice and Men, the story of Dungeons and Dragons and the people who play it by David Ewalt. This was a fun read about the history of Dungeons and Dragons. The author injects that some scenes from one of his own D&D campaign, which, is, which I liked, but Sometimes it strayed a bit, a little bit too far from the subject and covered a lot other role-playing games. I was really happy to identify with a lot of the scenes in this book and not just from playing the game. You can find my affiliate links down below. So this is his character in World Anvil. Um, he's an Inquisitor of Pelor. So Pelor is the, the Sun Father, the Shining One. He's a greater god of sunlight, strength, and healing. Um, he has two factions. And the faction that the player decided to choose to be part of is the strong arm, the, the side where there's paladins and inquisitor clerics, where the other half is more like priest and healing and nurturing the folk. The Flan are followers of the old faith, and Pelor is part of the cycle of life. Pelor has a deep relationship and vital relationship with the rest of the Flan old faith gods. In, in the world of Greyhawk, um, they get some special powers. On the right-hand side, you can see that at first level, uh, they get all their healing spells do a minimum of five hit points of healing. 
and cure serious wounds do nine, and cure critical does 16 minimum. That's just their special ability for being a cleric of Pelor. In, in the Will of Greyhawk, all the gods have these special favors or powers or spells granted to their clerics. The, uh, it's more, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of related to like wizard specialist, specialist wizards of AD&D second edition. They pretty much gave the same treatment to clerics. And I love that idea. It, it makes everything unique in the, in the campaign world of Greyhawk. So I'm using it. Um, at fifth level, they automatically save versus spells that deprive the priest of any sight, like darkness spells and blindness. At ninth level, they can, they, the fly spell, the wizard spell fly. And also, all clerics of Pillar get a plus two bonus for turning undead. Because that, that would make sense because it's a sun god. You know, when, it, when, you do, when you role play that and you describe your turning undead or casting a spell, it usually has a lot of light involved. You know, a glow, a divine glow, a shining beacon of light that's, that spreads out and engulfs everything around them in that casting. And, I, and my player had a lot of fun role-playing that while we were playing the game. The god of Pelor has many allies. Um, the Mehahin, demigoddess of protection, justice, and valor. Saint Bane, the scrowger. It lists all these allies that they have, like Heronia, Saint Cuthbert, Foltis, Trithrin, Rayo, uh, Corlin Lethian, Moradin, Carl Glittergold. And then the enemies, of course, is Neural. And that's all interesting stuff for the campaign and for the player to uh, role play with. Um, I like giving players a lot of this information to um, give them material to role play from. You know, if they got that information at hand, they're welcome to draw from it at any time in the game. And I give them props for doing it when they do remember. On the right hand side, it creates some prayers. Um, if they're, they're welcome to come up with their own prayers or and sermons, but they, if they start them off to give to start them off to give them a, a good direction to go. I created some sample prayers here that they could use. I find myself very impressed with a player that can come up with their own and role play, and that means they're more engaged into the campaign when they come up with that stuff out of game. So this works really well. And the sermon, um, I like to create sermons because whenever a player or the players step into a church anywhere in my campaign. I have a sermon. So usually, often, there will be a sermon being conducted in the church. And so I'll recite that as a background noise for the players as they're role-playing, going into the church, talking to one of the acolytes or one of the priests. And sometimes they'll hear this, or they'll be invited into the sermon, and I have it all written out so I can use it. Then, of course, we have tenets of faith down below on the right-hand side. For example, I do not do wrong to the good things of the world. Things like that. It's good for role-playing purposes. Um, we got deacons, we got vicars, we got bishops, we have archbishops and primates and cardinals and patriots, a high sun keeper. We have paladins of the faith too. So if a player wanted to be a paladin, I have description here for that. Then we have the scriptures and myths and legends and tenets of more tenets of faith. And so this information is really useful when running the campaign. So when we created the player's background, we took a lot of this in, we, you know, the ideas of what they were saying here to incorporate it into his background. Switching back to his character. So we created this background, and he's a, he's a writer, so he went on and on about this. He created a pretty long background, a lot longer than the other players in my group. Um, I'll, I'll go over this briefly so we don't have to spend an hour reading this long background, but it's really interesting, and I find that uh, it really immersive in the world around it, around him, like what it's like to be a cleric of Pelor in the church there in the city of Herpavank, and also what it's like to live in that city. So let's continue here. Before we go into his background, on the right-hand side, there's his stats, um, a little bit of description of him there, and also his current status. He's an acolyte. Um, he's 20 years old. He's 6'1", and his current location is the church of Pelor in Verbabank. On the left side, which is the south east side of the city, because um, as I keep saying over and over in my videos, the city is backwards. That's Southgate, and that's the Viscounty of Verbabank beyond those gates right there. But if you go a little bit more east in the city, this big square building right here, B20, is the chapel of uh, Pelor. And what I like about it is it has a lot of grounds for um, crops and vegetables and gardens, and it's a big building. And uh, lets a lot of light in, so it's pretty thematic. And that's where he was raised and trained as a cleric. So let's go back to his main character again. Um, he, he goes into a little bit of a story about his character. Um, he talks about how the novice's sandals slapped against the twilight-lit paving stones of the open courtyard. Um, he, he was running through the temple. He took steps. 
He took the steps between the pillars two at a time. So he's, he's going someplace quickly. Then he slowed his pace to enter the long hall, and his, his footsteps became quiet susurrations as he glided into the semi-darkness. Um, so he describes what the halls look like and what the temple looks like as he's walking through it. And then he finally gets to the door he's looking for. Yeah, I skipped all that for you. <laughs> he knocked three times, and then from within inside, he hear a calm, deep voice that carried easily through that solid door. What is it? I am most sorry to disturb you, your eminence. This is an urgent matter that requires your immediate attention. Something. He, tra he trailed off, afraid to say more. So then the door opens, um, and it reveals the bishop, the Bishop of Pelor. His name is Charles Evertide. And that's his character NPC sheet, the article in World Anvil. Um, it describes how, what he looks like and all the politics and what he does. And so he's dressed in orange and yellow robe. The novice bowed his head in deference. And then the bishop will ask again. I ask again, what is it? He stated in the same calm tone. The novice turned away from the penetrating gaze of the Archbishop Charles Evertide and motioned for the man to follow. So at the front gate, there's a group of initiates, men and women. They stand in a half circle. Some clutched small crystals that emanate pure white light. As the archbishop approached, the parted, bowing deferentially, revealing a small basket sitting at the bottom of the steps that led to the temple. The stone around it still radiates traces of heat. A woman spoke up, almost a whisper. The watch reported a noise disturbance and claimed that this, she gestured at the basket, appeared in a flash of red light. We detected a heavy strain of conjuration magic, but dared not proceed without your guidance. The archbishop nodded absently and approached the basket. He removed a dark lodestone absently, reflectively, from the, pocket, uh, from the pocket of his robe and spoke a few words of protection before bending and moving aside the garments that covered the basket top. His eyes widened as he saw a shock of red hair streaked with almost yellow blonde hair and the sleeping baby it grew from. No indication of any other planar essence or the maleficent aura of evil emanated, so he knelt. As he got closer, he saw a piece of paper tucked beneath the chin of the baby. As he reached for it, the babe opened its honey-eyed eyes and returned the stare of the archbishop and smiled. He unfolded the note and read, It contained a single word, Heinrich. Then the archbishop spoke to the rest. Take this baby to the head inquisitor. He will be in charge of raising this child. He turned without another word and walked back into the temple. His face was impassive, but his mind turned over the portents of what that meant. Tomorrow, or rather today, was Midsummer's Day, and there was much to do. Okay, so that introduction was um, how Heinrich arrived at the church, you know, out of nowhere. And we don't know why or who left the baby there in a the basket at the church. And so it's up to me as the DM to flush it out and fill that in later in the campaign. The next part of this article is Heinrich's, how he was raised, and what his life was like in the Church of Pelor. Heinrich grew up in the Temple of Pelor in Verbabank. He had no shortage of nursemaids as a baby and toddler, and was always taught to be fastidious and cleanliness and garb. While he did not excel in his education, he did learn to read and write, and after showed deep insight into the lessons that other students mastered quicker and better than he did. He understood bigger concepts and was able to extrapolate and put ideas together better than rote learning of facts like others. His disposition earned him the surname Sonin Straw, which translates to sunbeam. He has always been of cheerful disposition despite his penchant for seriousness, and his thick red hair with blonde streaks was only outshined by his golden eyes. He really did love himself. So as a young boy, he was strong and well-built and was clear that he could grow into a large, handsome, capable man. In his early boyhood, he spent mucking out at the stables, tending the herb gardens, and cleaning chores of the temple. He developed an almost uncanny relationship with the horses while cleaning the stables. And by 10, he was more than capable of riding and taming horses. It was not a matter of using his brute strength and size. He seemed to be more encouraged to horses through sheer will and communication. His other two loves were the herbalism and blacksmithing. You notice he has a lot of background skills. <laughs> it's kind of convoluted, but I let him get away with it. Two very different aspects, but one was due to devotion to Pelor and the curative properties of the herbs and plants that facilitated healing. 
I like that part, the herbalism and the healing part, because that is pretty much in their wheelhouse. And the other was the fascination with the heat of molten metals, which I thought was a stretch for a cleric of Heller, but I let him have it. And the sheer joy of forming metals into shapes that would help defend his body from harm, as well as those that would harm those who chose evil. His size was a factor in this, and the local smiths were always happy to have that brute, that brute strength and energy that he would become calling. Often he would return from these sojourns into the city proper, smelling of fire and metal, and would nurse his own wounds taken while practicing smithing and concoctions of herbs and poultices. Um, one of the reasons, as I mentioned in previous videos of how to create a role-playing character background, is that the, the reason for having a background like, like this determines what kind of background skills you have as a player before you became an adventurer. So when the, when the player is playing the game and he wants to perform some sort of action and his background matches an activity he's trying to do, I'll give him a bonus. He'll get a bonus in doing that. Like if he wanted to swim across this wide river with a strong current, well, um, normally that would be a difficult, uh, a, that'd be considered a difficult chance of succeeding. And so, uh, so depending on the game, like Castles of Crusaders would be a five DC or a five challenge level. Um, he would have to make his strength check at minus five. So that would be the ruling. But the player would say, wait a minute, I grew up on my father's fishing boat fishing the river my entire life before I became an adventurer. I'm a really good swimmer. He goes, you know what? You're right. Okay, we'll go ahead and waive that difficulty um, penalty and because you're so good at swimming. No problem. But of course, other penalties could crop up, like if you're wearing armor, things like that. Like I was saying, your background can actually affect your chances of success in any activity in the campaign. And that's a good example. So we'll continue. At age 15, Vicar, Jard Royston. Um, this person is militant. The Vicar is uh, militant and non-comprising. Long black jet hair, combed back, tightly trimmed hair, penetrating brown eyes. So we have a whole background for him and his politics and what his duties are in the Church of Heller. So he's obviously uh, the, been tasked with Heinrichs' upbringing, determining that it was time to begin his training, not only in the martial skills, which Heinrichs' size and strength was well suited to perform, but also his initiation into the clergy. The Vicar had thought initially that Heinrich would become a paladin of the Order of Pelor. You know, with his stats, he definitely could have been a paladin, but he really wanted to be a cleric. So that's why we have this inquisitor arm of the church. Um, so initially he thought he would be a paladin. But it became clear as he grew into a man that his calling was more suited to be a cleric than a knight. And so he was taught the mystical ways of divine magic. This Heinrich took with preternatural ease. It was as if he had already developed a strong connection between himself and Pelor, and that many did not gain until much further along their path. Heinrich's eyes shone bright each time he called upon the pow powers of Pelor, and his face took on a seriousness which he normally did not possess as he repeated those orisons and prayers. He learned to swing his heavy mace as his, from horseback, in which he would all but destroy the practiced dummies as he rode down upon them, guiding his horse with nothing but his legs. And he preferred combat on his feet with a large shield in hand. Isn't there anything he can't do? So five years have passed, all this training. Heinrich mastered all but was been taught about Pelor and looked upon Jard Royston, the Vicor, as a boy who looks upon a father. He had the fervor of an inquisitor and was very clear that he would not be one of the flock that spent time blessing fields and ministering to the sick. His role would be to rout out evil root out evil, and spread the light of the sun wherever he went, bringing the glory of Pelor and the fear to those who opposed that was good. So, to wrap this up, <laughs> it's a pretty long one, isn't it? Um, it was just after his 20th birthday that Heinrich was summoned before both the Archbishop and the Vicar in the year 576 Common Year, which is the starting year for the Temple of Elemental Evil campaign that I run. It was and he was handed a scrawled message. They told him they wanted him to summon the summons from Lady Osbury, ensure that a devout group of adventurers were chosen and to watch over them. They explained that they had done divinations and their readings had been layered in areas of darkness that their magic could not penetrate. And he was to be the eyes of the church. 
He was to begin his life outside the temple for the first time and spread the glory of Pelor among the common citizens well and, of course, to report back anything important to them. Heinrich collected his belongings, donned his armor, and headed to Jaili's Inn with a prayer of thanks to Pelor singing through his soul. Sign forth thy light, drive back the darkness, let the sun rise, let the shadows flee, both in the world and in the hearts of men. He was ready. So at this point, um, he's got a mission, you know, a starter. He's got a hook to start this campaign off with, which is interesting because it's his masters of the order that are sending him on this mission to not only to find out what Lady Jolly wants, but to help her organize a party to make sure that adventuring party is successful, to, to become their leader pretty much, and also to report back anything he learns. So he's, to, he's commanded to do such a thing. And he does throughout the campaign send letters, updates to his superiors. And at one point in the campaign, he does come back and talks to them in person. Okay, so the, the, this is Heinrich's day activities. This is what happens before he meets the rest of the players. The clearest story over the bed awakens you for the first rays of Pelor shining on your face in its full glory. You are awakened with excitement of the day of worship. You prepare your normal bath. You cleaned and pressed robes. Don your cherished holy symbol of Pelor while murmuring a prayer. Then head out into the temple halls with your brothers and sisters. One of the brothers approaches you with an urgent message from the Vicar, requesting you to his presence in his chambers. Walking through the halls to see other greeting worshippers, laying out drink and food, and preparing the infirmary as you make your way to the altar of the sun to praise Pelor with a morning prayer. You pass the healing hall and see a small group of people forming a line outside. There's an older man leaning heavily on a boy, clearly keeping weight off of his left foot, and a trio of inebriated soldiers, split-lipped and black-eyed, and women shouts, Make way! And the line shuffles aside to allow the passage of a priestess and two acolytes carrying the unconscious man bleeding from his head. So that was happening in the chapel on his way to go visit uh, the head of the order, the archbishop and the vicar. So he knocks on the vicar's chamber, led by an acolyte to his office. He's absorbed, frowning, and concerned at the missives on his desk. Looking up, he waves you over to take a seat across from him. It seems one of the Viscounty's lords is in need of assistance. I see that they do not wish this information to be known by the other lords and churches for political reasons. They did not request assistance from their benefactor, Archbishop Hoffren, nor from any other faiths. Find out what Lady Osbury is in need of and offer your assistance. Determine her agency and report to me everything you learn. The Vicor hands you a scroll signed by a noble. The bottom of the page displays the official crest of House Osbury. You only know that this is one of the houses of the Viscounty south of Penwick, where one of the chapels of Pelor is located. So there is a chapel of Pelor there, which he does visit. As you can see, Baroness Osbury is recruiting a band of adventurers for some unnamed task. I do not think I need to remind you, Acolyte Heinrich, that you represent the Temple of Pelor first and foremost, that you will act accordingly and bring praise to our faith. This is an opportunity that should not be wasted. If you have no further questions, you will assemble your gear. Be on your way. May the divine light of Pelor give you guidance and strength in all that is to come. He waves a hand, dismissing you, as he's done countless times in the past. And his forehead creases in consternation at once again returns his attention to the pile of paper scattered across his desk. Okay, so now we're outside this, the, the temple. And now the player has agency. He's out on his own. Things are happening. So he walks along the market square, beholding the sights, the sounds, the smells of the city. Any type of food, clothing, or other sundry items can be had here for a price. Some of the shops are open-aired booths. Okay, I hope that's better. I zoomed in for you. Including the ones selling food. Others are closed-in shops. Most of these are being fine clothiers, equipment shops, and miscellaneous stores such as jewelers and herbalists. You can see that it would be easy to spend too much time gold here 
on tasty treats and unique items that you've seen nowhere else. Thinking of gold makes you instinctively reach down for your money pouch as you remember that this place is a prime vicinity for thieves and cut purses. Um, if we had a thief in this campaign, I'd probably have him start here. This would be a great location for a player thief to start the campaign. Uh, maybe he sees um, this priest of Pelor carrying that missive, and it's identical to the one that's in his hand that he found at the Venturers Guild. And he sees, it, you know, they both see it, so maybe they'll start talking or follow each other, or maybe the thief will follow him. It'd be really interesting if the thief decides to pick his pocket. The more time you spend walking along the market square, the more the facade fades away in your eyes. At first, this place was exciting and seemed almost beautiful in its diversity, but if you look deeper, you notice the reality of such a spot as this. Surely, surely there are great things to be had here, but there's also dangers. Your earlier thoughts of protecting your purse comes back to you as you see a poorly dressed young man bump into a well-dressed old woman. She doesn't notice it, but you see that the teen teenager has walked away with her money purse, a grin of satisfaction on his lips. I like to throw things in there once in a while to give the players an idea what it's like to be here, to give some life to the city. I want them to have a very strong memories of the city later on in the campaign. Further along, you see a small boy standing among a group of soldiers. They're eating hard bread and jerky bought from a nearby market stand. The boy, obviously hungry and poor, moves about like a small mouse grabbing bits of bread that soldiers drop as they eat. It's hard to feel sorry for the boy, however, because you can see a fierce determination in his green eyes as he pilfers the small morsels. The sounds of the place are almost deafening. Hawkers are yelling at potential customers. Children are running, laughing. Groups of people are all talking at once. All these sounds assault your ears as you make your way through the square. As much as this city's marketplace has to offer, it's still anxious to buy what you need and make your way to a quieter part of town. At this point, I'll ask the player if you want anything you want to buy, and then we'll role play the different um, merchants and he can purchase what he's looking for. Um, I, I could actually have a, a situation where he gets pickpocketed or something and throw an NPC in here. We already have too much on our plate for day one, and I don't want to spend any more time than I already am spending with the player in this uh, before they meet the rest of the players. Um, I talk about a dozen merchants. Um, so if he is looking for something, I got another paragraph for that. He goes, oh, I'm looking for something. And, you know, what do I see? And I'll have this whole paragraph of what it looks like, all the different uh, booths around him at the merchant place. Okay, so finally, um, he decides to leave the trader's market. But before he does, I have encounter number one waiting for him. Istis, a priestess of Istis, a soothsayer. I think this is a good time for encounter something like this in this campaign. You know, it's good to throw the prophecies in the path of players, give them some foreboding, something to think about. And I decided that this character needs one because as you remember, I gave all these different encounters for the other players in this group, especially the fighter. You know, he thinks he's the chosen one by Rayo, which was really awesome. I was really impressed how that, how I pulled that off and how the player reacted to it. So I needed to give something that's just almost just as good to this player. So this is what happens. From out of the tent, draped in colorful layers of silks, a back lunous woman of golden skin tones, high cheekbones, tall and slender with straight, fine, long, bluish hair. She fixes her unnerving gray eyes upon you. So now the player's taken it back. You know, what's going on here? What does he want? And typically a player at this point will kind of brush it off. They don't think it's much of anything. It's just some merchant trying to sell them something. At that moment, they don't understand what's really gonna happen. But then you hear her say, Inquisitor Heinrich, I see your strand of fate. I see it as plain as a ship's tether. It is strong and disappears east over the horizon. Come in, come in. I have much to tell. Have a seat at Istis's table. Maybe I can discern your fate for a fee. She leads Heinrich into the cramped tent, dominated by a small table layered in more silks. Many tallow candles light the tent, casting it into an unnatural purple light. She takes a seat across the table from you and waves her bejeweled hand at the opposite seat for you to sit. She curls, and he does. I'm asking him questions as we're doing this, so he's responding. He can walk out any time or doing go into the tent, but he does. She curls her very long nails around the silvery bowl engraved with flowing runes. 
Thence he reaches down under the table and draws out this crystal skull covered with withering silver ruins that flow around the orb. You hear a faint multitude of whispers emanating from within, but you are unable to make out the words, as if a dozen voices are speaking all at once. She holds the skull over the bowl. The silvery liquid in the bowl swirls upwards in this to circle the skull as her eyes glow with the same color. Then she whispers her ritual and intones the words. By me calls light and wisdom's might. The past shall point towards the future. Behold, the true power of Istis, the lady of our fate. There are few with the knowledge to create an artifact with such potential. Tis world, so many heroes, so many lives. I watch them come and go, and they pay me no mind. No one notices an old woman. Your destiny is not here. You, you are different. You see the realm, you see the petty peasants. Soon, you'll see so much more. I seek only them who want to know the truth. Them brave enough to stand against the storm when it comes to defend the realm. My arteries shine light upon that truth. When you are ready, gather your companions and return to them. Can you feel it? The ill wind blowing from across the green horizon. These lands of gnome and man, then call to me. They seem much to chill the blood. The old one, a deep hunger, a heart of fire. But them always promised the freedom of the realm. Now, though, a new danger is coming with the seasons. Already it changed the world to its liking. And if what it wants can't be found, it will take everything. Want to know its name? Hmm? The one who brought this ruin worships at the desecrated altar of black stone. All you think you know about your life and death is only the beginning. With your heart still to beaten, you will see those cursed halls with new eyes. Bring order to chaos and the demon of venom when you raise the priest skull of the one who never sleeps, all I can do is show you the way. Travel to another world, and you will do the same. Take these words for the journey. If you read them right, then whispers have been, and what is yet to be, whispers to help you save a companion's life. Now off on your journey, the door is open, the raving madman is waiting, and our time is trickling away. Okay, so that was what happened when he went into the tent and heard this, and it really freaked him out. Um, he paid her the coin, and then as he walked out, she escorted him out the gate, and as he turned to talk to her, she was no longer there, and the tent was gone. It was just a swirling mist where the tent was that dissipates into the air. So we'll continue on his journey, shaking his head, uh, he leaves the trader's market behind and makes his way through the crowd up the sloping road to the bridge walk road. Slowly weaving your way forward, the sound of each person going about his or her own business adds to the general cacophony of the, of the street. You pause a moment to keep your bearings. You pause a moment to get your bearings, stopping amid a sea of moving bodies. Those behind you grumble loudly as they sove past, smelling something remarkably similar to horse droppings. You glance to your right, and beside you is a tall half-orc that lumbers near you, going in the same direction. His head is kept hidden by the hood of the Gnarly Forest cloak. You have seen him before, loafing around the Adventurer's Guild and the Trader's Market. The crowd seems to move out of his way, letting him pass with minimal contact. By the way, this, this is Urad, the other player character, in case you haven't picked up on that yet. If only you were a huge, smelly, tough person, people would get out of your way quick, letting you reach your destination faster. 
You see his, you see his clutching a letter in his hand. It's a copy of the one given to you by the vicar. It's a letter of request from Lady Eleanor Osbury. It seems he may have received one as well. But from where and why? So, the two of you leaving the construction site of the new cathedral of the official state religion of St. Cuthbert. Archbishop Hoffman not only has the Viscounties firmly devoted to his faith, but now he is building a cathedral to compare to the Trithrin. Across the street, an old man sits by the side of a ditch, cackling. His weathered limbs are visible through the tears in his clothing. He's holding a stick and occasionally fishes something out of the ditch, which he then thrusts into a stinking old sack next to him. Then he cackles some more. The combination of smells near him is intense and in intensely unpleasant. You notice pillars of clouds building on the west. It might rain tonight. So I got a description on what the buildings and the streets look like. The buildings rise up on either side of you. Um, the hanging wood signs along the street creak rhythmically to the gentle breeze. The hanging wood signs along the street are creaking rhythmically to the gentle breeze. Um, they have garris painted planks, um, the site of advertisements for the businesses common to such a bustling city. Cobblers, wheel wheelwrights, barrel makers, iron workers, and glass blowers are all present here. All the signs are crudely wrought but effective, decorated with a simple picture depicting the business's trade the, for the benefit of the, most, of the mostly illiterate customer. So he approaches Bridgewalk Road. The sound of loud shouting comes to his ears. It seems to be coming from around the next block. But before he can react, three gnomes stalk furiously out from around that corner and bear, do bear straight down on you. Expressions of anger and frustration is on their faces. Three diminutively, solidly built gnomes are chatting angrily, brown-skinned and blue-eyed with faces red with anger. They are unarmed and wear rich clothing of a merchant. And that finishes his background. And that is the start of the encounter with um, getting involved with the known problem. They just got done arguing with that merchant. And their cousin, and Blinky, is, Blink, is still arguing with that merchant around the street. So Heinrich can go investigate and hear what's going on for himself. So that ends Heinrich's um, report and session one, or session zero, really. Um, after this point, he's going to go ahead, after the gnome encounter of witnessing that argument, he's going to go to Jolly's Inn, and he's going to meet all the other players there, too. And in case you're interested, uh, this is the Church of Peller, uh, B20, and this is the article where you have a description of what it looks like outside, description inside. The summer tree with Pellor as a central figure. Um, each spring, Obed High is born and grows into an eager... Do so we have, we have a description of the faith. We have some artwork here. We have some goods and services of what, for healing, um, magic items, and um, cremation of the dead, and things like that. Uh, we have the descriptions of what it looks like inside the office, the church office, the temple gardens, and the altar of Pelor, what it looks like when you look at it, and purpose and function of this church. So I, I make sure I have this available in case, which did happen, that the player will invite the rest of the parties back to the church for some reason or another. And so I have a description going through the church to convey to the players. So far we had a background video on Magus Gloomleaf here. Um, he's from the Wrinkle Academy. To his right is Urad Muduk, uh, Mudak from the Gnarly Forest. He's a ranger. Um, he keeps um, his head down low. He never smiles and keeps his hood low over his face. So nobody can really spot his features in the city. And he never smiles and he rarely talks. So they will not notice his canines. Um, then we have um, Vigon, the mercenary warrior here that we did another video about already. Um, we're not going to do one for Samus because he joined the campaign late and Elfwine did too. So they, have, they don't really have backgrounds that are rooted within the city of Verbevank. They met them on the road. So this wraps up um, the video for Heinrich, the cleric of the party. Um, this is the last one I'll do for the party itself. The next video I'm going to create is the actual starter campaign from the Living Greyhawk series for Lady Eleanor Osbury. They're gonna meet her at Jolly's Inn and they're gonna meet, all meet for the first time or some of them I already know each other from the previous encounters they had in the city, but they're all gonna to come together as a group for the first time at the inn. And my next video will be all about that encounter and accepting that quest and leaving the city. Did you enjoy video? Consider tossing support on my Patreon. It best ways to support orcs. If you would like to see more content, Subscribe and post comments below. It better not be bad. 
If you like what you see here, please go to my Patreon, subscribe there. I usually provide PDFs of what I'm talking about, the articles that I refer to there for people to download so they can use it in their campaigns. Uh, if you have any requests or questions about the campaign, don't hesitate to ask me here in the YouTube channel or um, over on my Patreon, and I can talk to you about what maybe I can make a video or make some changes there too. And also tell me what you've done in your campaign that had your players start at the city of Riverbank or how you'd handle it differently. Thank you for watching. Have fun running your Temple of Elemental Evil campaign and your players will have a good time. Mm -hmm.